Hello everyone, this is Dr. Flores and today I'm going to be introducing you to sociology. So before you, you'll see the learning objectives. If you read the chapter, you'll go over all of these learning objectives, but for my lecture, I will be focusing on the most hardest concepts to go over. So let's talk about sociology. What is sociology? Sociology is just the study of human behaviors in groups because we do find patterns. We could find patterns at the micro level and at the macro level, right? Micro sociology, macro sociology, or you could call it macro level of analysis or micro level of analysis, right? So micro sociology is the analysis of social life that focuses on social interaction and approach usually. So it focuses on small groups. This consists of groups in a classroom, it consists of groups in a conference uh, auditorium, it consists of individuals in uh, a football stadium. As long as you could observe them, it is considered micro sociology. However, macro level of analysis is when you study large groups. You can't put them in one location to observe them, but you can gather the data and analyze it. Like, for example, all ethnic groups in the United States of America, all genders, all male and females, right? From the United States of America or the state of Texas, right? So these are groups that are large enough where you need to gather the data, but you cannot observe for social patterns. So now let's break it down by types of data. Quantitative data is data that you use that consists of numbers. Qualitative data is non-tangible data. This is data that you would need to add a degree of analysis to it. Um, so for example, love, what is love? you would need to measure it based on the construct that you as a researcher would add to that variable. Hopefully that makes sense. So examples of qualitative data would be your opinion. It would be emotions such as love. It would be media, right? Media online, pictures, videos, anything that you observe that you cannot attach a number to uh, because it doesn't come with a number and examples of that would include people in public areas right you could just sit down on a bench and then observe the public and find patterns in human behavior now if you want to construct a measurement to those behaviors or observations then you could add numbers to that measurement for example on a scale from one to ten how in love are you right so but you are constructing that measurement So if you truly understand these terms that I just mentioned to you, now you have the opportunity to test your skills. Let's go ahead and use a laptop or your cell phone. And I want you to research an article online from a reporter. It does not have to be a peer reviewed article. We'll get into that in the next upcoming chapters. And I want you to look up an article that a reporter was talking about any issue in society. It could include typically murder, any type of crime, um, recently with the news going on, oppressive topics, um, and identify whether the data that they are sharing with you, is it at the micro level? Is it using small groups that you could observe? Is it at the macro level? Is it data that consists of every individual from a group across the US or in a state? Tell me, is it quantitative data? Does it naturally come with numbers? Thousands, two thousands, billions of people? Or is it qualitative data? Is it based on an opinion, a behavior, a picture, a video? What kind of data do they provide? During correct. Let's move on to positivism. So positivism is a term that sociologists have applied where we could use the scientific method, which is a seven or eight steps, depending which textbook or approach you're using. It's applied to typically topics found in science or in labs, but we as sociologists feel that the scientific method can also be applied to human behavior, right? 
This is how we came up with sociology. When we study human behavior and we gather data, we gather enough data to actually explain a phenomenon. So here we jump into theories, right? There's three sociological paradigms or three theories that sociologists usually always refer to. These are symbolic interaction theory, functional theory, and conflict theory. Functional theory can also be known as structural and functional theory, functionalism, uh, symbolic interactionism, or symbolic interaction theory, right? They have different names, but very, very similar to the main concept, right? So when we look at symbolic interaction theory, that analyzes the data at the micro level and functional and conflict analyze data or explain the data using a macro approach. So symbolic interactionism focuses on symbols and interactions and the interpretation of these symbols in interactions when we are observing human behavior. So notice that you have to be present in order to observe the interactions and symbols. Functional theory focuses at the macro level and it focuses on large groups and it identifies patterns as to how one large group serves a function for another. Then conflict theory Again, focuses at the macro level, focuses on large groups, but specifically it focuses on the rich and the poor and how there's conflict between these two groups for the surplus value, um, the scarce resource, whatever it is that keeps the rich rich, right? And within conflict theory, we have many components, but when I mention the rich and the poor, you could also label them such as the proletariat, which are the workers, the poor, and then the bourgeoisie, which is the rich, the capitalists. So let's talk about research methods. Here we have a meta-analysis, which is a research method. And a meta-analysis is the study of many peer-reviewed articles, many research studies that other researchers have conducted and published in one area, in one topic, right? Because if you want to become the expert in your field, you would need to find a topic and a problem, find all the peer-reviewed articles related to that, and analyze all those articles, which is then considered a meta-analysis, right? A hypothesis is an educated guess. It usually has an independent variable and dependent variable, right? It's usually studying how one thing affects another thing. Variables are factors thought to be significant for behavior, which vary from case to case. So variables would be a component in your study that you're studying, right? Validity is when something is measuring what it says it's supposed to be measuring. Reliability is when you measure a variable and it actually produces the same results over and over again. So you have two different types of variables. You have the independent variable and then you have the dependent variable. So the independent variable is the variable that is independent. Think of it as a person who's independent and it is the one who's very influential, right? On the other variable. The other variable is called the dependent variable. The dependent variable is the one that changes depending on the independent variable. And don't forget that research method is not the same as the scientific method. Research method is when one of six, well, there's more than six now, right? But based on your chapter, you go over a certain amount of research methods. Um, and so these methods are procedures that sociologists or any researcher uses to collect the data. Okay, so this slide is going to jump into sociological imagination, which is a very important concept in sociology. It's sociological imagination is basically when someone makes a connection between the personal challenges, the biology, and a larger social issue, right? So you're connecting the micro and macro level of analysis because you're connecting the, your biography and the historical events that have occurred or are occurring 
as you are making these observations, right? But typically throughout your observations, it is a trend that has been happening at the macro level for some time now. So let's take, for example, here on the right, you'll see this chart. And you just think about the children per women. You'll see that that rate is moving lower, right? So if you are a person who has less children than the older generation, you'll see that you fall under this trend of families having smaller family units. Same thing goes for the divorce rates. It's declining, but the total is still high for the overall population, right? Infant mortality. So infants who are dying, that's decreasing. And it's only when you take a deeper look as to how in the past we haven't had so many medical advancements that you'll understand why that's declining. The standard of clean houses, that's declining. And if you look at the rate of women who are going into the workforce, you'll also see that double dipping, being at home and trying to maintain a clean home and working full time has increased. So that in itself would help explain this trend. Abuse and neglect rates are high, but they're declining. STDs, sexually transmitted diseases, that's declining, but it's still high. Percent of families in poverty, that is declining, but that's still high. Uh, elementary to high school education completion rates, that is high, but declining. And number of abortion that is high but it's still declining now this chart was not published in 2022 so i'm sure this trend is going to go um here take a social problems class and understand how abortion rates um, increase whenever it's banned so increasing would be divorce rates, remarried families, and here we could assume is because of the divorce rates, uh, elderly families, again, we could assume with the advancements of the medical advancements, the life expectancy, again, medical advancements, quality of adoption process for children and families, that's increasing. And we have a lot of technological advancements here that could contribute to this. Benefits from being married compared to other statuses, and that would be the government um, and take a marriage and family class, that all in itself um, kind of contradicts the myth that being single helps you live longer and happier and healthier. That's, that's a myth. Uh, so when it comes to benefits, here we could be referring to uh, benefits from employment, employers, the government, tax deductions, the list goes on when it comes to benefits. But if you take a marriage and family class, you'll also know that there's health benefits when you are married versus single, right? So it's not clear, but nonetheless, we do have data that can help you understand why this trend at the macro level are happening in each of these categories. And if you find yourself in any of these categories, that would be the micro level of analysis connected with the macro level of analysis, which then helps you understand uh, these trends through a sociological imagination perspective. Hopefully that makes sense. Again, sociological imagination is when one can connect your life with larger trends. So let's select a social concern listed here in this chart and apply sociological imagination to explain the trends mentioned in the titles up here for the column in red.
thought study. So now let's talk about sociological influencers. Here we have August Comte, who actually talked about how positivism, which is the application of the scientific method, can be applied to human behaviors. Harriet Martin New talks about, or is a female who came from upper class, who loved sociology and studying sociology, and she helped translate August Comte's writing so that more people could be exposed to sociology. Karl Marx, the father of conflict theory, talks about conflict theory, and by now we should know what that is. He also talks about how Within conflict theory, we could name the lower class proletariats, the upper class bourgeoisie, and whenever an individual connects with the bourgeoisie and they're really proletariats, he calls this false class consciousness when you don't actually understand your position to the means of production which is a worker versus owner. And he also talks about class consciousness, which is referring to how you are aware of your position in this hierarchy when it comes to your relationship to the means of production. Surplus value is a leftover money whenever there is business conducted and that is not shared equally between the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. So Herbert Spencer is a sociologist who coined the term survival of the fittest before Darwin actually published it. So this is just referring to how in society, obviously, those who are smarter, stronger, faster survive. Emil Durkheim was the first to actually apply positivism in society. Although August Comte coined it, Emil Durkheim initiated the first study in human behavior and he studied suicide and found that the single Protestant man, not married men, the single men who in the middle of the war lost their business, who believed in the Protestant religion that said, if you are going to heaven, God will bless you with many prosperous um, blessings. And so in the middle of the war, when they lost their business, they were not married and did not have someone to turn to, uh, and they would commit suicide at the highest rate. Till this day, we have the single man, white man, who have high rates of suicide. Um, it's a trend first found by Herbert Spencer, and it's still a trend, unfortunately. Max Weber uh, created the term Verstein. He, said, he believed that when you observe different individuals and study them, you need to put yourself in their shoes to better understand them. Jane Addams, another female sociologist from an upper class family, created the Hull House. She, uh, it just recently closed down and she basically created a good, a shelter for immigrants and she helped them transition into America lifestyles. Here we have Webb Dubois. He has created the National Association for Advancement of Colored People, which still exists today. He had a PhD, and when he would attend conferences to talk about sociological topics, he would have to enter from the back of the restaurant because of the segregation laws. So now let's talk about applied versus pure sociology. Pure sociology or basic sociology is just when you actually study groups in society and you leave it at that. You understand it and you move on. You could possibly publish it. But applied sociology is when you actually study groups in society in efforts to solve issues such as the suicide rates, right? Let's go back to the previous and based on what I have told you about each of these influencers, can you identify 
which sociologist is a pure sociologist and which ones were actually. So here's a better perspective focused on the theorists. So let's talk about hypothesis versus theory. We've discussed it really quick at the beginning of this presentation and we discussed how a hypothesis is an educated guess, a theory is an explanation of a phenomenon. We talked about how in sociology we have three sociological paradigms known as symbolic interaction theory, functional theory, and conflict theory. Here we break it down. I've mentioned to you that symbolic interaction theory is at the micro level because you need to observe the interactions and the symbols so that you can interpret their meaning, right? So the focus is on face-to-face -face interactions and the symbols so we could better understand their meaning. And when we apply symbolic interaction theory to uh, divorce rates in the US, symbolic interactionists would say industrialization and urbanization changed marital roles and led to the re defining of love, marriage, children, and divorce. Okay, so let's move on to functional theory, which is at the macro level and focuses on groups and how there's functions for basically at least one group. And when it comes to applying functionalism to divorce rates, a functionalist would say social change uh, erodes the traditional functions of the family, family ties, it weakens the family ties, and the divorce rates increase. Conflict theorists would say uh, that we study this topic, divorce rates, at the macro level. And remember, there's always the rich and the poor struggling for scarce resources. These are large groups. And conflict theorists would say that when men control the economic life, the divorce rate is low because women find new alternatives to a bad marriage. The high divorce rate reflects a shift in the balance of power between men and women. So this is a little cheat sheet that I created for my students, for my classes. I want you guys to realize that you could break it down whenever you apply these theories to any topic and symbolic is micro, functional is macro, conflict is macro, and symbolic, you could use this template by saying observations found in an interaction that have symbols and the symbols hold different messages, right? Functional theorists, you could break that down, that definition down by saying one large group serves a function for another large group, right? And then conflict theory would be broken down by the following, two large groups who are always fighting for that scarce resource, right? At this point, we're gonna go ahead and take the time to use this template and apply these theories to any topic of your liking, right? If you wanna talk about, you know, the rich and the poor, if you wanna talk about abortion rates, if you wanna talk about a certain celebrity who's all over the media right now, let's go ahead and do that. Uh, use these little templates, the underlying words. You could just substitute them for actual groups in the topic of your choosing. So in this chapter, we should have learned about sociology, micro macro sociology, quantitative versus qualitative uh, data, the sociological influencers, applied versus pure sociology. We went over sociological imagination, the difference between hypothesis and a theory, and we went into detail on symbolic interaction theory, functional theory, and conflict.